What is up my friends? My name is Kim and if you like true crime like I do, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. I post two times a week and you don't want to miss a thing. I hope you're having a fabulous day today. Today I have a little bit of green tea. Not very good. No, don't recommend, but it'll get me through this video. Do you guys have a favorite tea? I'm looking for some new ones. I have my favorites, but I'm always looking for new ones. So if you guys have any of your favorites, please leave them down in the comments. Today's case is another case involving a child. I know, I promise there will be other videos on my channel. I just, I have a list going whenever I get a request. And so I just add it to my list and then I just kind of work my way down the list and I didn't realize it. But once I started researching this case, I was like, I kind of want to do this one. So I apologize that there's two cases in a row that we have some really, really bad parents. Today we're going to be talking about Tiffany Moss and Tiffany killed Amani in the most cruel way ever. Amani was her stepdaughter. She was only 10 years old. Let's get into it now. <laughs> because this is a case of a Cinderella story gone horribly wrong. In this case, there won't be any glass slipper. There won't be any handsome prints. The defendant doesn't have to be home by midnight. And there won't be any happy ending. Because this is a case where you only have the evil stepmother. And as a result of that, an 11-year-old child was starved to death. Imani Gabriel Moss was born April 23rd, 2003. She was named after her dad, Iman. Adorable. She didn't have a great start. Mom was addicted to drugs and really did not take any interest in Imani. So Imani was raised by her dad, Iman Moss. He gained sole custody of Imani and she honestly just didn't have really any contact with her mom after that point. So Iman, he's raising Imani on his own, doing the best he could. Imani and her dad would go to church, Freedom Christian Church, regularly every Sunday. This is when Iman met Tiffany. Tiffany was introduced to Iman by his friend, and they ended up hitting it off. Tiffany, at first glance, she was an educated woman. She had completed college. She was working within a school. Iman and her relationship moved very quickly. It wasn't long before Iman and Tiffany would move in together. So we have Tiffany, we have Imani, and we have Iman. And they all are getting along really well at the start. Iman and Tiffany would get married July 2009 and had two children of their own over the years. They had a son and they had a daughter. But the relationship between Tiffany and Iman's daughter, Imani, would become a point of contention in the Moss household. This would come to light for outsiders outside of the Moss household in March of 2010. Imani was only six years old. Poor Imani went to the school nurse and said, I'm afraid to go home with another bad report card. She also told the nurse that her stepmother had spanked her with a curtain rod and with a belt at times. So the nurse examines her, looks her over, and what does she find? Multiple scabs, bruises, welts on Imani's arms, back, her chest, her legs, her shoulders. Imani was immediately taken to the police station. Tiffany was arrested and charged with first-degree child cruelty. Tiffany admitted to hitting Imani like two or three times after she failed to do her homework. She was six years old. I definitely think there was more to that story, but maybe it is better that we just don't know. Tiffany pled guilty and was sentenced to five years of probation as part of Georgia's first offender program. The plea deal was signed by the Georgia Division of Child and Children's Services. They dismissed a case against Tiffany and Amon after they completed parenting classes. It's kind of interesting how they think parenting classes for six weeks are going to really 
Anyways, but because of this, Tiffany lost her job. The job she had gone to school for, she had gone to college, she was mid in her career, it was all over for Tiffany. Instead of looking in the mirror and taking responsibility, she took her anger out on Imani. She deeply believed that it was Imani's fault that she had lost her job. Not the fact that she had abused her in a very cruel way. No, she became resentful of Imani. If she hated Imani before, you better believe at this point she hated and resented Imani for taking her career away. I cannot put into words how evil and sick Tiffany Moss is. In fact, my shirt today says I hate Mondays, but actually I really don't mind Mondays, but just replace Mondays with Tiffany Moss, okay? Right after the charges for Tiffany, Amani was removed from the home. She was placed with her grandmother, while with her grandma, Robin was her name, Amani thrived. She was doing well in school, was looking healthy. She seemed overall happier. Imani's grandmother took notice right away, but knew this was only temporary. So when the six months were over and Tiffany and Aman finished these magical parenting classes, it was going to be time for Imani to return back to them. Imani's grandma, Robin, begged Iman, her father, to let her stay with her. She was doing so well, but Iman would later state his pride got in the way. Um, do you recall where you were interviewed by the Gwinnett County Police Department in regard to an issue with Imani? Yes. Tell the jury how that, how you found out about that and how that happened. Um, I was at work and um, I get a phone call from, a, I think, a detective. I can't remember the name, but I know I got a phone call from a detective saying I had to come to the police station. They didn't tell me what. They just said I need, need an emergency. I think Batania said, Batania to your child. So I just left work, let my manager know, and I just hopped in the car and just drove all the way down there. Right. While you were at the police department, did you find out that your wife had been accused of, of beating your child? Yes, when I got down there. And did you give a statement to the police in that regard? Uh, yes, I spoke with the uh, detective. And did you become aware that she was eventually arrested? Yes, uh, she got arrested there. And do you know whatever happened with that case? Um, to the plea of probation, five years to my knowledge. Tell me what life was like after that at your house. <laughs> it was rough. Um, was Tiffany allowed to work as a teacher after that? No. Did Tiffany ever work after 2010? No. Um, did you ever see any problems between Imani and Tiffany while you were at Pearlie's? Yes. Tell me about those. Um. Ever since the, going back to 2010, ever since then, it was like a, like a love-hate relationship. Tell me, explain to the jury what you mean by a love-hate relationship. Um, you know, her and Monty was like, um, it was always something, they couldn't get along. But how did, uh, the question was, how did she, how did she end up staying at your mother's house after? Um, defects. We moved out, the, out of our home and put it with grandma. And how long did she live with grandma after the 2010 incident? I want to say about, I want to say six months. Did you ever talk to your mom about Imani staying with her? Yeah, I have. And wh how did you feel about that? Um, I didn't really mind. Right. But, I, but I'm talking about after 2010, um, did your mom ever ask for Imani to come and live with her? Yes, yeah. And what did you say to that? Um, I, I, in my pride, I said I was trying to prove something to my mom that I can do it, and I said no. And he refused to let Imani stay with her grandma. This man, I cannot. It was 2012 when the next report came in. 
Imani had just finished third grade. Imani ran to the front of the apartment building to the leasing office. She would explain to them that she didn't want to live in her home anymore because her stepmom was not being nice to her. The police were called, and when the officer asked little Imani what was going on, she explained that her stepmom in the last week had tied her to a chair and put her in a freezing cold shower. Tiffany is still on probation. Because Imani didn't have bruises, the officer gave Imani back to them. He questioned Tiffany, but she would just say that Imani was acting out because she was jealous. She was jealous of Tiffany and her dad's relationship. As well, she was jealous of their new baby brother. Tiffany said, I don't punish her anymore because I'm on probation. She would tell the officer, I leave that to Monty's dad. The officer put a report in, but it was never followed up on, and poor Imani had to go back to that home and with even more angry Tiffany. What was the point of even being on probation? It was absolutely pointless. The CPS worker closed the case, and the police didn't see any physical evidence, and I'm sure that was done intentionally, that Tiffany purposely made sure she didn't have any bruises on her. That's why she put her in the cold shower, allegedly. So nobody did anything. It actually breaks my heart, but it gets worse. Four weeks later, in July of 2012, Imani, only nine years old, was desperately trying to have her voice heard to anybody that would listen she runs away it was later in the evening it was dark outside imani not fearing the dark but rather her stepmother she runs out the door tiffany sees her run out of the door and does absolutely nothing she just oh she ran out the house oh well she doesn't call the police eight nine o'clock 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, midnight. She's not concerned. She did nothing. It wasn't until Iman got home from work that the police were called. The police showed up to the house, just took a look around the house, and what did they find? They find nine-year-old Imani sleeping in a bush almost 1 a.m. in the morning. And once again, Nothing happened to protect Imani. Now it was time for Imani to start school. She was going into the fourth grade. Her teacher would testify that she did so well. She wasn't in trouble for anything. She wasn't going to the principal's office. Nothing like that. Imani would brag about her little brother and how she loved her little brother. Very contradictory to the earlier statements that Tiffany said that Imani was jealous of her brother. That brings us to May 12, 2013. It's Mother's Day and the Moss family gets together to celebrate Mother's Day together. It is the first time they had seen Imani in months. They show up to the family's house and the family was shocked by what Imani looks like. She was thin, and her once long, thick hair was completely cut off. Her once hair that had two pigtails or a pigtail in the back was gone. Her hair was uncombed, cut off. Iman, the dad, was asked by his sister, what happened to her hair? And he responded with, she cut off her own hair. He knew that was not the truth, and his sister obviously didn't believe him because Imani loved her hair. Imani was proud of her beautiful hair. That same day, the Grandma Robin asked Tiffany, what did you do to that baby's hair? Tiffany's response, brace yourself and get ready for your blood to boil. She responds, you act ugly, then you should look ugly. Shut the front door. No, this woman, she said, you act ugly, then you should look ugly. So now it brings us to the start of fifth grade for Imani. 
With Tiffany unemployed, Iman, her husband, and Imani's dad worked two full-time jobs to support them. He was gone each day for 16 hours, and then you have travel time on top of that for his two employers. He was rarely in the home during the week, and Tiffany would never work again. So Iman took on that financial responsibility fully. So there's Tiffany, Iman, Imani, and they now have two kids, the boy and the girl. Over the years, they moved in and out of family. You know, a new family starting out, they struggled a little bit. You know, Tiffany was unemployed, so they struggled a little bit. But at this point, they moved into their own apartment. They got a three-bedroom, two-bath, beautiful apartment, and they moved in. And what do they decide? Tiffany and Iman decide that Imani should be homeschooled. Excuse me, what? Yes, Tiffany is now going to homeschool Imani. Don't think for a minute that's what she wanted to do because she had a background in education. And that is, as the prosecutor would put it, isolate and hide. So what do they decide with two full-time jobs by by Amon? He told you they had to have three times the salary, or his salary had to be three times what the rent was. And so what did he do? He did it. He worked 16 hours a day so that he could get a three-bedroom apartment, two-bath apartment for this defendant and his children. That's why the work records, you see the work records to show that in fact, yes, that is where Amon was going 16 hours a day. But in the end of August and early September, what did they do? They moved to Veranda Chase here in Gwinnett, and that was absolutely the beginning of the end. It was the beginning of the end for Amani because they moved to that apartment, and now what? There is no one else watching. And what do they do? They decide they're going to homeschool Amani. They're going to homeschool her. Sharonese, Amani's sister, knew immediately there were red flags at that moment. Yes, she was a trained teacher, but she hadn't taught in years, and clearly the relationship between her and Amani was not good. She had two small children at home, and Sharon Neese immediately said, red flags went up. This was a horrible idea. This was a very bad idea. Why would you homeschool her? And what did she do? She was so concerned, she called defects. She reported it again, spoke on the phone with DFACS because she knew that this was not going to be okay, that Amani was not going to be okay being homeschooled. Because what was homeschool? Homeschooling was code words for isolate and hide. We can isolate this children from everyone she knows. She will not see friends every day. She will not see her family. She will not have a teacher that can save her and protect her. She will be in this apartment and the only two adults will be this defendant and a father who is gone 16 hours a day. She no longer had her friends, teachers, the school nurse. She had nobody to protect her. Amani's aunt seen right away, oh no, and she called CPS. She wasted no time. She knew this was a bad idea, but again, they did nothing. A neighbor would testify in the trial that since they moved into that apartment in the couple of months that they were there, they may have seen her once, and that was through September and October. They saw the other younger children with Tiffany and Amon, the ones that they had together, but they rarely seen Imani. She didn't go outside to play. It is believed at this time she was locked in her room and was being deprived of food and water. In fact, Imani was so hungry, it is believed that she tried to get some leftovers from the stove and a pot of boiling water was pulled down and burned the front of her. That is the story Iman gave of what happened. But again, like the haircut situation, Iman couldn't be totally trusted because he would cover for Tiffany. The burns were determined to be second to third degree burns to both her abdomen and the front of her legs. 
It could not be confirmed about how exactly she was burned. Tiffany sent a text to Iman and told him she burned herself with hot tub water, but Tiffany was known to send cover-up text as well, so it's not known exactly how she got these burns. What is known is that Imani needed help. She needed a doctor. She was not taken for medical treatment. Tiffany, instead of taking her to a doctor, Tiffany sent a text to Iman and said, I put some aloe on them. By October, Imani was being so starved that she could no longer leave her bed. She was going to the bathroom on herself in her bed. If she could muster up any energy, she would go next to her bed just so she didn't have to lay in her own waist. She couldn't walk to the bathroom. Her organs were shutting down from being starved. As Imani is locked in her room, her stepmother Tiffany watched it all happen. She made the decision to stop feeding her. And a father who is only home to sleep for a couple hours, except for on weekends. It got so bad that Imani came home from work. Imani was in the bathtub. He described her as what could be consistent with having a seizure. Her eyes were twitching around. Her body was stiff. He tells Tiffany, we need to call 911. She tells him, absolutely not. She would go to jail and they would lose everything if they did that. She tells him, you need to think about the rest of the family. You need to think about your other two kids. So he picks her up and puts her back in her bed. She would never leave her bed from that day forward. She laid in her bed so long, she actually got bed sores on her backside. She would lay in that bed for the next five days until her death. She weighed 32 pounds at 10 years old. They starved that little girl to death. Her dad ignored the problem. He just went to work. Each job like clockwork. Even the day that he got the call from Tiffany stating Imani had passed away. The day had come. We knew it was going to happen. She, she passed away. He came home from his one job and went to work. He went to work. He gets out of work. He wraps Imani in a blanket, takes her out of her bed, and puts her in the office. Tiffany goes shopping. She buys new bedding for Imani's room. She literally could not wait to forget this child ever existed. So Imani is wrapped up in a blanket in the office. He turns to Tiffany and says, what should we do? She says, we need to turn on our criminal minds. Tiffany had been off work for way too long and TV was clearly her pastime. So yeah, she says, we can't call the cops. We need to keep the family together and we, we need to turn on our criminal minds. They decide that they were going to cremate Imani. There is so much wrong with this plan, but this is what a college educated woman and Imani's daddy Iman decide would be the best plan. So he goes to work again for the next couple of days. Poor Imani's body just laid in the office. So on the 30th of October, Iman is seen going to Walmart, buying charcoal briskets and a large metal garbage can. He brings it home and he goes to work again. He clearly is the employee of the frickin' month. It's now Halloween, October 31st. Tiffany goes shopping for herself. That's when she buys the new bedding for Imani's room. She is excited to just redo that room and forget all about this whole thing. She gets her other two kids all dressed up to go trick-or-treating. Mind you, this poor girl is lying in a blanket in the office. She gets her other two kids all decked out, goes trick-or-treating. She laughs. She takes pictures of them. Iman gets off the of work that night. They now are going to have to perform this DIY cremation. Imani's body was 
by this point in a rigor mortis stage so they have to actually duct tape her legs together to be able for them to go into this garbage bin it just chills me they put her in this bin load her in the back of this trailblazer the other two kids in tow they got them in the back seat and they head out to a secluded field they take the garbage can out with Amani's body in it they take it out of the SUV and they douse her in lighter fluid and they set it on fire. It doesn't turn out the way that they thought. A professional cremation would take a couple hours at 1400 degrees. So them attempting to do this would have been very difficult. And they realized this after an hour or so. Iman says, this is messed up. And it was messed up and they decide to put out the flames because the can is so hot they have to wait there for it to cool once it does they load her back in the suv and they go home and go to sleep with imani's body in that garbage can in the back of the suv still iman gets up that morning goes to work with her body still in the garbage can in the back of the SUV, he goes to work with her in the back. Do you suppose this was his escape? His way of dealing with everything is by going to work? I'm just not sure how he's functioning. But Iman does finally crack. I could only imagine he was exhausted at this point and just wanted it to be over. He called his cousin and he tells him everything. He asked his cousin's advice. What should I do? His cousin point blank says, call 911. There is no other option. So Iman gets home from work and tells Tiffany, that's it, I'm calling the cops. Tiffany loses it. She freaks out. She grabs the two other kids, the two younger kids, takes them to her mom's house. She tells her mom, do not let them take her babies. Because Tiffany loved her other two children. They were not neglected. They had no abuse. Those were the apples of her eyes. And it's just amazing how she could treat poor Imani the way she did, but she treated her other kids so well. Like you would hope kids would be. Yeah. Sort of they were celebrating Halloween and dressing up and going yeah. trick-or-treating and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. As a grandma to all those children, to know that one of your loved ones is being treated so poorly, I, mm -hmm. can you make sense of that? Or? I can't because I don't understand why these are healthy, Tristan and Emma are healthy, and why my granddaughter in the room starving to death. I didn't. I don't. I don't. I can't. What well, accept the concept of that? Because no child should go without food or water. Mm -hmm. And why are you mistreating her? And you're not mistreating the other ones. And that's when I know that nothing's wrong with you. You're just a mean person. But anyways, Tiffany's on the run. She drops her kids off. She's hiding. She went somewhere. But eventually, she would turn herself in. The cops arrive in Amon there. And he tells them that she drank some, some fluid. I, he makes up a story. It wasn't true. It doesn't matter. He, The cops walk over and they open up that can and they are just surprised what they saw. They were not expecting to see what they saw. Iman's under arrest and Tiffany are both under arrest. Tiffany ended up turning herself in, like I said. So all the information that I told you is from the prosecutor in the trial. Unfortunately, there is no information in the way of defense to dispute the prosecutor's information because Tiffany decided to represent herself. And her way of representing herself is by not calling any witnesses, not questioning, not cross-examining, by saying nothing. She didn't do opening statements. She didn't do closing arguments. She basically showed up to court and did nothing to actually represent herself. Iman took a guilty plea and he was sentenced to a life in prison to, av to avoid the death sentence and agreed to testify in Tiffany's trial, 
with all the information that he had. Tiffany, for whatever reason, said she was going to represent herself and pleaded not guilty. She did nothing to represent herself at all. I'm not even sure why she even did this. It is the most bizarre trial I have ever watched. Tiffany was like ice. She never shed one tear. She didn't express not one emotion. She doodled on pen and paper for a five-day trial. The jury only took two hours to come back with a guilty verdict. She was sentenced to death. Bingo. So just to show you how unemotional she was, this is her expression when the judge told her she was sentenced to death. As to penalty, count one, murder, we, the jury, recommend and fix the penalty as death. A Gwinnett County stepmother stared straight ahead, briefly looked down for just a moment before she raised her head again and then listened to the verdict that she has been sentenced to death in Gwinnett County. Here are some examples of some of the other people's death sentences, how you expect one would react when you get a death sentence. Forgiveness is not an option for me. After everyone had their chance to speak in this Wapolo County courtroom, it was Dustin Armstrong's chance to say something about what he'd done. Do you have anything you wish to say to me prior to my announcing what I'm going to do here today, sir? <coughs> In that case, felonious assault, a felony of the second degree, it is ordered that the defendant shall serve a term of two years in prison on that count. As to count three of that case, the robbery, which is also a felony of the second degree, the court uh, orders that the defendant shall serve a term of two years on that oh, count as well. And just review that. And then I'm going to show you Tiffany. Before she raised her head again and then Listen to the verdict that she has been sentenced to death in Gwinnett County. Even the most notorious criminals have some emotion. I wish I could ask her what she was doing and why she even ended up doing a trial. Was she wanting to waste taxpayers' money? The last I saw, she got lawyers to appeal her death sentence, but with what's going on in a in the world, I'm sure it's just been put on hold. If I hear anything, I'll put a pinned comment below. But I kind of feel like she already had an expensive trial. They're going to actually let her have another trial because she decided not to represent herself. It's a complete waste of time. So apparently this case brought some reform to Georgia's child welfare system. But I swear we hear that time and time again. I cover these cases all the time and they decide they're going to do a reform to child welfare. But here we are again. It just seems like it's a never-ending battle. But that's what they said, so I'm including it. This case was definitely a tough one. Poor Imani did not deserve the life that she was given. This child, time and time again, just wanted a, a voice, and she was ignored time and time again. And her dad, this went on for four years, since she was six years old when the first allegation happened, right? When the first allegation happened when she was six years old, Tiffany and Amon had only been married for less than a year, and this went on from six to ten years old before her death. Iman had to know what was going on. And I think there's more than a financial reason of why he was working 16 hours a day. I just feel like that was his escape. I don't know. Imani was telling so many people. She was running away. She was telling people in the office. She was telling officers, you know, the apartment office, she told. She was anybody that would listen. So I have a hard time believing that she wasn't going to her father and saying, I'm hungry, Dad, she's not feeding me, or she's beating me, or she ran cold water on me. I believe a lot of things happened in secrecy, but he's not blind. 
and he did take responsibility at the end of the day. I'm just so angry at him. I know she's evil, but he knew right from wrong. I mean, she knew right from wrong, too. I mean, she worked in the school system. She took care of other kids, her other kids that she had with Iman. She took care of those. So she knew right from wrong, but but he was her father. I, I don't know. I was really hard on him, but honestly, he pled guilty. He did the right thing in the end, I suppose. You can look at it that way because he pled guilty and he is spending the rest of his life in jail, like no chance of parole. So he's getting his punishment. I guess there just isn't a great enough punishment for Tiffany. And like I said, she, Tiffany worked in the school system. She worked with other kids. I just... To have that much hate and anger. And it's unfortunate because Tiffany did not say anything. She hasn't done any interviews. There is little information about Tiffany. Her mom took the stand, but because it was only the prosecutor that asked her questions, it was pretty fast. I mean, it, she didn't ask about her childhood. I don't know. What kind of life did Tiffany grow up in? Why did she hate Imani the way that she did long before she lost her career? You know, why was she beating her? Was she jealous of Imani and her dad's relationship? This case really got me. It really did. I just, it's just hard to imagine. And the fact that she's so ice cold. You guys let me know what you think about this. And what do you think she was doing with the trial? Do you think she was just trying to waste taxpayers' money or she just got in too deep and she was too embarrassed to get back out? I don't, that's a, a strange one for me. I just can't wrap my brain around that. But if you guys made it to the end, you guys are rock stars and I love you to death. There are more true crime videos in my Captured Killers playlist if you'd like to check those out. But either way, stay safe, my loves. I'll see you in my next one. Bye.